Hi guys, Dr. Dillard here. Let's talk about malignant melanoma. We started this a little bit last week with when we talked about lentigo malignant melanoma, but now this is the the other, the more common types of malignant melanoma. It's dermatology, it's spring 2021. This is uh, lecture six or week six. And yep, yeah, melanoma, malignant melanoma is often just called malignant melan or it's often just called melanoma. Sometimes it's called superficial spreading melanoma, which is the most common type of it, but there are other types of it as we'll see. Or SSM, or lentigo malignant melanoma. This is its uh, malignant melanoma is its own its own category. And there's a picture of um, nasty malignant melanoma kind of on a surrounded by a little inflammatory process. That's always a bad sign if you see little inflammation going around, something that dark looking. All right, so what is it? It's a malignancy of melanocytes. We talked about those little octopus-like looking things that their job is to inject brand new born keratinocytes and give them some color. That's what gives your skin its color. Uh, but the malignancy due to gene mutations or sun damage to the nucleus of these, uh, the mutation creates a melanocyte that grows out of control and it becomes immortal. So these melanocytes need to be replaced by basal cells every now and then, but not these cancerous ones. It is one of the most deadly types of cancer because of its ability to metastasize. It has a sixth sense, if you will, at finding, at finding lymph vessels and invading them. It can go right through the endothelial, endothelium of a lymph vessel or right through the entire wall of a lymph vessel, tunica adventitia, tunica media, uh, tunica intima. It can go right through that whole wall and get into the bloodstream. If it gets into the bloodstream, it's off to the races. Who knows where it's going to end up? In the lungs, could be in the liver, could be in the brain. So not a, a very dangerous cancer because of its ability to metastasize. Where does it occur? Its most common spot is on the skin, sun-exposed regions of the skin. Uh, it can also be seen in the mucosal membranes of the oral, conjunctival, or even vag uh, vaginal. Uh, can be seen in the eye. Uh, the leptomeninges it can occasionally occur, which of course you can't see in most of those. The eye, you can see it there, but some types are very aggressive. Some are, they're all aggressive, but some are more aggressive than others. Uh, the more common type, the superficial spreading, has a slower radial growth phase. Remember we said last time that uh, can skin cancer can spread kind of perpendicular to the skin and become very, very large. Uh, specifically, we talked about lentigo maligna and lentigo malignant melanoma. Were, remember those gigantic lesions we saw in people's faces? Uh, the spread was more, more horizontally, and uh, that's not. It can't. There's no. There's no blood vessels or there's no lymph vessels that it can get into. Um, so that's good. Uh, but the malignant melanomas like to dive down. They like to. They have a quick a relatively short horizontal growth phase and they dive down. In fact, the nodular form has virtually no no horizontal growth phase. It just dives straight down and once it gets into the, the deep dermis and subcutaneous tissue, there's some really big lymph vessels there and blood vessels there that it can penetrate and then it's off to the races uh, to your brain and lungs and um, that's usually fatal when that happens. There are gene mutations. We're not going into the weeds on these, uh, but there's the uh, the BRAF, BRAF mutation. There's the NRAS mutation. There's the KIT mutation, which is a tumor suppressor gene. Um, these are these are therefore called oncogenes because of their ability to mute uh, cause mutated uh, mutated cells if they get turned on. It's the fifth most common cause of cancer in men, the sixth most common cause in females. Remember, good board question, what's the most common type of skin cancer? 
uh, its basal cell carcinoma is number one, followed by squamous cell carcinoma. The lifetime risk is about 1.5% in humans. Uh, it is on the rise. For example, in 1935, the risk was about 0.07%. So now I don't know if this is because of better better ways of keeping track of, of data compared to paper records back in the 1935s. So I'm not really sure, but it seems to be on the rise. Um, yeah, and it, as we just said, other epidemiological studies indicate the incidence is increasing faster than any other type of cancer. Possibly could be due to a thinning ozone and more people are being exposed to uh, more UV radiation, which is causing mutations of melanocytes. Uh, it's thought that the incidence will double in 15 years, according to Bologna. Uh, white people are at risk. They have a 10 time greater chance of getting this than other races. Uh, the highest risk population is Caucasian, Australians, and New Zealand because there's lots of sun right down by the equator. Uh, the medium age of diagnosis is 57, and the medium age of death, you can see, is 10 years after that. So the 10-year prognosis sometimes isn't very good for this condition. Got to catch this one early. Uh, in fact, with regard to skin cancer deaths, it accounts for 90% or greater than 90% of all skin cancer deaths. So if you're going to die of skin cancer, this is by far the most common one to die fast. You can die from other ones too, but this one is the one you have to really watch out for. Uh, it's also the most common cancer in young adults, especially young females. But again, basal, car basal cell carcinoma is still the most common type of skin cancer overall. Uh, risk factors, we just said having a, well, we didn't say this one, having a past history if mom or dad or daughters or a sister, uh, if someone else has it, then you're increased risk for the disease. Uh, again, Caucasians with lightly pigmented skin, especially redheads with blue or green eyes. Uh, and then you add freckles in on top of that. This, this girl uh, should definitely stay out of the sun. She's at much higher risk than uh, normal people walking around. Uh, if you have a pre-existing condition called xeroderma pigmentosa, that is also a risk. That's a genetic disorder where uh, the DNA pair mechanisms don't work because D DNA can be damaged by the sun, but you can repair it. Uh, you have mechanisms to repair DNA damage. More risk factors. Uh, the more sunburns you've had increases your chance of getting it. The total, the total exposure that you've gotten over your lifetime the greater that is, the greater your chances of getting this. Uh, the total time you've been in tanning beds during your teens and 20s, second and third decade of life, increases the chance. They always tell you those tanning beds are not dangerous. That is not true. You should not go in those things, in my humble opinion. Uh, having lots of acquired melanocytic nevi uh, and lentigines, those are lentigo lesions. So if you have a bunch of lentigo lesions, on you or a bunch of moles on you, you're at increased risk as well. Uh, here's a young girl, more than 250 uh, uh, nevi on her body, and that nevi is a mole, uh, or you could call it a melanocytic. There's congenital melanocytic nevi. I have a video on that, but we'll get to that. I think that's our last lecture. Uh, but she's at, she's got to watch the sun too. She's at increased risk for cancer. She's got to watch all those moles carefully uh, to make sure they're not changing. What's the strongest risk factor? Having a genetic mutation, like the kit mutation, and being down near the equator. Uh, and we could add hat being a, a Caucasian. And to make it even worse, how about a redhead, blue-eyed, fair-skinned Caucasian Australian living down by the equator who loves the sun and has the kit mutation? Almost guaranteed to get it. Uh, the warning signs, I should have put this in earlier, but I, I don't think I did. So this slide I always ask, I mean, if there's one thing you learn in dermatology, it's this slide right here. When do you refer somebody to a dermatologist? Well, the ABCDE rule. Uh, if the lesion is 
asymmetrical in shape, but the, the first one in here should be diameter. If it's a little tiny two millimeter little dot, you're not going to worry about it. You're going to watch it, but don't worry about it. Uh, but if it's over five, this, uh, the five millimeters or, or the size, or if it's five millimeters or bigger, which is the size of the eraser of a number two pencil, then you got to look at these other things. Uh, is it asymmetrical in shape? Can you fold it in half? If no, refer them out. Is the border irregular and choppy? We can draw we can draw them right here. Here's a irregular. Let's say we're looking down at someone's skin and you see that. And it's seven millimeters. That's got to go out, right? That's a irregular border. Uh, what if it's variegated? What if it's uh, brown? I don't think I have a brown color in here do I now we can use red but if it's you know like a light brown here uh, and then over here it's another color we talked about this uh, if it's variegated especially if it's coarsely variegated um, you refer them out and then the biggest one of all is then the patient will also often catch this themselves is it growing the patient comes in and says you know six months ago this didn't look like that um, that's that's always a little concerning. Uh, so any of those A, B, C, D, E criteria, if they get checked, but it's got to be. I mean, it doesn't. You have to have this one first. I mean, it doesn't work because if you have a tiny little dot and you think, oh, it's asymmetric shape, you don't have to send that one to the dermatologist. It's got to be bigger. Uh, it's got to be at least the size of a pencil, or it has to be evolving. All right, there are four types of malignant melanoma, superficial spreading, lentigo malignant melanoma, we talked about last one, remember that one's basically almost always on the head, face, scalp, neck. Um, Arcuolentigonous melanoma, we'll talk about today. Nodular melanoma, we'll talk about today. Superficial spreading melanoma is the most common, we'll talk about that today. The worst one of these to get is nodular melanoma. Let's talk about superficial spreading malignant melanoma. About 70%, if you're going to get melanoma, about 70% of the time it'll be superficial spreading, typically diagnosed at the age of 50. Um, it has a fairly long radial or horizontal growth phase. In other words, it doesn't take a deep dive into the dermis for between 8 and 24 months. You can see a picture of one here. Does that break the ABC rules? That's probably It's probably a centimeter in size at least. Yeah, look how variegated it is. It's dark here. We're missing some. It's normal skin color here. It's pink here. Uh, you can't fold this in half. It's irregular. It's not round. Uh, that just breaks all kinds of rules. That's got to go out. Um, although it can start anywhere, it likes the sun-exposed areas, especially the trunk, especially on the back where sun hits the back. But it can be anywhere in the trunk or legs. Uh, it can start de novo which means it starts out of the blue uh, or it could be a mole that's been present hanging out for a long time and then all of a sudden the mole starts changing that's not the norm it usually starts de novo although the authors are a little uh, a little conflicting on that whether uh, the prevalence of it coming from an actual mole but de novo seems to be the most common way to go um, Early on, when it's still in that radial growth phase or that horizontal growth phase, uh, you could call it a cancer in situ because it is made of severely dysplastic cells. It just hasn't penetrated deep into the dermis. Uh, it may be in the superficial dermis, that papillary layer of the dermis. Um, but So you could call it a cancer in situ, but it hasn't gotten into the, the third layer, the subcutis layer, whatever AK you want to use hypodermis, subcutis, subdermis, whatever. If it gets down there, you're in trouble. Uh, treatment of these in situ lesions are uh, quite successful. You want to catch it before it takes a deep dive because then it's hard. It's probably already gotten into the lymph system and it's off somewhere else in the body. Maybe a few years down the road, you'll get lung cancer from it. Uh, the in situ phase, the look of it uh, is typically brown, different colors of black and brown. It's usually a macule. It's flat. It's variegated, irregular borders. Uh, it may actually be less than uh, five millimeters when it starts out. 
Um, this is a dermoscopic view of it, so it's a huge magnification. You can even see the pigmentation. Now, you won't see this with the naked eye, um, but that's... Uh, and these are about 90% accurate dermoscopes that dermatologists have. Even dermatologists can get fooled sometimes. The histological evaluation is the gold standard. You always want to get these things biopsied when you're in doubt. Uh, the vertical growth phase. So after the horizontal growth phase or the radial growth phase, it takes a deep dive. Uh, and after, I don't know, eight months, a year, once it, once it goes down, it goes down quickly. It can get into the subcutaneous tissue within a month or so. Uh, very dangerous. For unknown reasons, it's really good at finding lymph capillaries and regular capillaries and invading them and then some of its cells get loose into the bloodstream and then you're in trouble. That's stage four cancer at that point. Lesion, uh, lesion in this phase may become papular nodular, so that's one of the bad signs if the superficial flat macule all of a sudden starts getting lumpy bumpy, that's a bad sign. See, here's an example. Uh, this was a lesion they were watching for a long time and then all of a sudden patient comes in and now it's got a nodule here. Um, so that's that's an indication that it's, it's already penetrated, gotten into the, uh, the deep subcutaneous tissue or that third layer down, whatever you want to call it. Now tumor regression, can these tumors naturally heal? Um, they do tend to get better, maybe not completely better, but about 66% of the early tumors uh, will appear and then they'll almost disappear and then they'll come back again. Um, by the way, a gray, if you ever see a gray color in a lesion, that's an indication uh, that uh, uh, the tumor is almost going back. Those are almost normal cells, that gray part. Um, but it can still kill you. You don't know what's going on down underneath it. So here's another dermoscope view. And you can see big patches, almost bald patches, where the tumor's been regressing here but it's still very dark here, uh, very variegated, very irregular shape. That's still, that's cancer. That's got to come off. That superficial spreading melanoma. Will it completely disappear? It's really rare for it to completely disappear. Uh, you, like I said, it usually fades in and out. Um, but once that, if you don't, if you mess around with this thing, it's going to kill you. Once you get that nodule formed, that typically means it's gotten down into the third layer in the hypodermis or subcutaneous tissue, all those AKAs, whatever you want to call it, the third layer down underneath the dermis. Bad news when that happens. It's kind of evidence that the, why is it regressing? That's because your body's immune system is fighting and killing off the cancer cells. So it's pretty good, uh, pretty good evidence that this, there's definitely an immune component to this disease. That's why people with depressed immune systems are at more risk for this as well. Now, the nodular form, it's not as common as the superficial form, uh, but it sure is deadly. In fact, it's the most in deadly, the most deadly type of cancer. There's some other really rare ones that are even more deadly. I won't even talk. I used to teach them, but they're, they're just way too rare. But this is the most deadly one. It's very, very aggressive. There's basically no vertical or radial growth phase. It just it just shows up and it's already diving down and gets below the dermis and now you're in trouble. Typically shows up around the age of 50. Kind of looks like a mole, doesn't it? Um, these are, that's why it's called nodular. It's, it's a nodule and it can be confused with a mole. Now that's not confused with a mole. Um, that definitely is uh, too big and you know, why that guy waited so long, I have no idea. Somebody probably told him, oh, that's just a mole. Don't worry, I have one of those. Don't worry about it. Yeah, it probably killed him. The nodulars account for about 22% of all melanomas, most frequently seen in the trunk, scalp, and neck. Um, these do not appear on the face usually. Remember, that's the area for lentigo malignant melanoma, although they could. It's not the norm for them. Um, and again, they they do not have a slow radial growth phase, much less than superficial spreading type does. Uh, and they can very rapidly, within months, they can get uh, into the subcutaneous tissue and metastasize. So these are very aggressive and very dangerous. They can be different colors. They're black, but they may be blue. Sometimes they're pink. Sometimes they're red. Sometimes they ulcerate and bleed. 
um, there's a nice example and you can look for this associated erythema here which is an inflammation of the tissue around uh, that's always a bad sign that it's cancerous if it has that ring of inflammation around it remember kind of like uh, uh, actinic keratosis has that red associated with it, that pre-cancer, pre-squamous cell cancer. All right, again, most developed de novo, from Bologna, uh, typically poor prognosis if, uh, if they develop pneumo uh, de novo and then within a couple months they already look like that. I mean, if that thing is changing, you got to get in. Makes makes me you know, all my medical care is at Stanford. I love Stanford, especially the old hospital. But boy, they sure have growth pains. Uh, I had a lesion. I teach dermatology, and I had a lesion. It broke the rules. I thought it was seborrheic keratosis, but it broke the rules, and it was it came on pretty fast. Tried to get in to to get to see a dermatologist. You know how long it took me? It took me eight months. And I talked to the dermatologist. I said, you know, what if this was nodular? Uh, malignant melanoma. I, I could be stage four, and she didn't say anything. But you know, that's a problem. You can't you can't wait with these things. I waited because I was pretty sure I was right. It was just seborrheic keratosis. Anyway, I'm digressing here. Um, yeah, so these are these are not good. Lentigo malignant melanoma. Just to, just to remember that we talked about it last week. Uh, remember, the diagnosis was in about 10% of the patients with malignant melanoma. Uh, malignant melanoma. This, is the, this, this is the type they'll get. Almost always seen on the face. Um, it's seen in two groups of people. Uh, people in their 60s, people in the 20s. I don't know why these slides are here. I need to put these back in the other section, I think. Uh, but it's good to repeat stuff. Uh, and, um, yeah, there's a... And, but they, the reason I put it here, it can look like... It can look like malignant melanoma. I mean, it's got a little nodule there and everything. Go check out my video on lentigo malignant melanoma. I know I have a more dedicated video to it. It's slow growing though. This one grows forever. It grows. They, it grows really, really big, right? We saw some taking over most of the cheeks and foreheads of some patients. Uh, it grows downward, but the vertical phase is really slow, so it's not nearly as worrisome as as any of the melanomas are. It does contain nodules, uh, so it can be confusing like that one. I mean, that little nodule. But because it's on the face, it's more likely this is a lentigo malignant melanoma than a nodular form of malignant melanoma. Um, yep, sometimes progresses for mal lentigo malignant. We talked about that. Here's a pretty big one, right? Uh, so it's got a huge kind of vertical growth or a huge horizontal or radial growth phase. So the cancer cells are spreading out kind of parallel to the skin, right underneath the skin, but they're not getting down to where the blood vessels are. So even though it doesn't look very good, it's not, uh, with regard to your life, it's not as big of an emergency, but it just sure, it's better if you nip this one in the bud, don't let it get like this, because now what are they going to do? Remember we said this is radiation, they're going to have to treat this with radiation. Although it's pretty effective, it's not completely effective. Another type of uh, melanoma is arcuo lentiginous melanoma. So arcuo, so like at acryl. Uh, I say arcuo, I keep saying that. It's acryl lentig lentiginous melanoma. Acryl, not arcuo. Thinking of something else, like the arcuate line. Acryl lentiginous melanoma. Uh, or ALM. Uh, this one is relatively uncommon. It's about 5% of all melanomas. Uh, these show up in the 60s, or the, which is the same as the seventh decade of life. Uh, there are three places these can show up, either, either in the palms or the sides of the hand and sides of the feet, uh, or the nail apparatus underneath the nail plate uh, or in the skin around the nail. They can show up. People of color are at high risk for this type of cancer. In fact, this is the one that killed Bob Marley. 70% are diagnosed in African Americans compared to white people. Um, and they can be subtle. Look at that little thing. Right? And they biopsy that, and sure enough, it was melanoma. Uh, acrolentigonous melanoma. 
and they're typically brown or black looking. It looks kind of like a lentigo lesion, but remember lentigo lesions don't show up on your palms uh, or your soles or um, they can show up in your, you can get some streaking. Uh, Melanonychia we talked about, um, but on your palms and soles, you're not going to have lentigo lesions. Okay, um, these are, needless to say, they're misdiagnosed in about 30%. Primary doctors are very bad at picking this one up. You wouldn't get this. It doesn't even break the 5 millimeter rule yet. Uh, but once it got to 5 millimeters and it's growing, you would, you would catch it then. But uh, very common to misdiagnose these. Um, it can occur in the nail matrix as well. So it can start right in here. And if these become mutated, they can grow forward just like Melanonychia does. You can get streaks in your nail, but we said they should be thin streaks, not gigantic thick ones like this. Uh, that's cancer. That's melanoma. And so uh, it gets a special name uh, when it gets in the nail. It's called subungual anechomycosis or subungual, sorry, uh, subungual melanoma is when it... Uh, is when you have cancer in this area. And it looks just like longitudinal malachia. The key where you can tell this is not benign longitudinal melanonychia is you can see it's gotten into here, uh, into that proximal nail fold, and it's way too wide, right? We said it shouldn't be that wide. Hutchinson's sign means it's gotten into the skin here around the nail, the proximal nail fold, right? Yep, acryl antagonist melanoma. Tigus melanoma of the first toenail, underneath his first toenail, is what killed Bob Marley. Even after it was diagnosed, he, for, he refused medical treatment, the story goes. And he tried, you know, all that fringe treatment, herbs, and this and that. And by the time it got into his brain and his lungs, it was too late. Um, yep, that's everything we said. Uh, so this is subungual melanoma, a form of... Acryl antagonist melanoma occurs from melanocytes of the nail matrix that become cancerous and grow longitudinally, and it can look like melan. Uh, it can look like. It can just look like those the regular old streaks in the nail. Um, but we said it can look like melanonychia. That's those are streaks in the nail. But melanonychia, remember. It would be like this. It might be brown, but it might be maybe this big at the most. If it gets bigger than like this, that's I mean that's not good. That's cancer. Right, here's another one. Hutchinson sign. Not only is it in the proximal nail fold, it's gotten all the way up into her uh, her interphalangeal joint here. This is not. It's not a mole in her nail. It's not. Now this is bad, right? Massive Hutchinson sign. That's acryl antigonous melanoma. And that one you can't miss. How could somebody let this be on their nose for so long? I just don't understand. That's nodular melanoma, and it's probably already in his lungs and brain. Here's flat. It's not nodular, but that's superficial spreading melanoma. That's the most common type. It's bigger than a pencil eraser. Can't fold it in half. It's variegated. Out it goes. This one, this was a... I almost hesitate to put this case in here because it's uh, so rare. Uh, but what, is, what does this look like to you? It does have, it's kind of hard to see, but there is a little raised region right here. Maybe even here as well. What does that look like? No, not lentigo. Lentigo is flat and it's not variegated like this. This is the great imitator. You would think this would be seborrheic keratosis. And... Dermatologists missed this one, uh, but but smartly got it biopsied, and it did turn out to be malignant melanoma, superficial spreading uh, malignant melanoma, which has gotten a lesion, meaning it got down into the uh, subcutaneous tissue. How do you make the diagnosis? You got to catch these things early. Um, you have to look. You have to send them to a dermatologist. If you're a dermatologist, what do you do with these things? You have to look under a dermoscope. Uh, to see what they look like. Patient history is so, so important. Um, if the patient says, you know, this has gotten bigger over the last year or over the last couple months, that's you need to biopsy that thing. Uh, especially if they say there's a change in color or shape or size, those are all red flags. 
Bologna says that these changes are uh, the most sensitive clinical sign for melanoma is what comes out of the patient's mouth and the observation. So that's a very important. That the patient shouldn't be blown off. They have to, you have to listen to the patients. Some other signs of melanoma is that red, that kind of red ring of inflammation. That erythema means red, but it's an inflammation that surrounds the lesion. In fact, there's a, uh, FG, uh, a EFG rule. If the lesion is elevated, firm, and growing, um, that's another way to some dermatologists, kind of for primary docs, use the EFG rule. If it's elevated, if it's firm to the touch, and it's been growing, they refer it out. ABCDE rule is better, though, I think. Um, and diagnostic, diagnostic accuracy uh, by a dermatologist, a dermatologist laying their eyeballs on it for melanoma is only about 75%. Even if they get out their giant magnifying thing, that dermoscope, uh, that brings the diagnosis to 90, but the 10% of melanomas would be missed by dermatologists if they didn't biopsy them, or more commonly, if the patient refuses to get the biopsy. You know, that's just silly. You go to a dermatologist and you refuse the biopsy, that's just, you're playing with fire there. Uh, Garb's rule of dermatology is interesting. Uh, it says that if a patient is worried about a skin lesion, don't ignore their suspicion and uh, perform a biopsy. You have a very low threshold. Listen to the patients, in other words. Uh, there's a bunch of conditions that can imitate melanoma, unfortunately. You could break them down to those that are pigmented or melanocytic category and those that are not pigmented, a non-melanocytic uh, melanocytic ca uh, category. So the melanocytic imitators uh, are the mole is a common one then we don't call it a mole we call it a nevus or a nevi is plural a nevus is singular uh, especially arcuel uh, nevi or clark's nevi atypical and typical spitz nevi congenital nevi used to have slides in all these but we just don't have time so i don't talk about them anymore uh, we need this class to be uh, two hours long instead of 45 minutes and I can put some more of this stuff in. Non-melanocytic nevi, so seborrheic keratosis uh, is the great imitator. We just saw a case where uh, it really looked like seborrheic keratosis. It was melanoma. Actinic keratosis can also imitate it, although well, because it can get that red kind of border around it, so it can that way it can be uh, look a little bit. Some atypical lentigo. Uh, then the other cancers, superficial basal cell carcinoma, pigmented basal cell carcinoma, uh, and even a thrombosed hemangioma, tumor of blood vessels, can sometimes look like it. So uh, those are the imitators. What's the prognosis for melanoma? It all depends when you catch it. If you catch, if you do the biopsy and it's already in the subcutaneous tissue, uh, then you you might be in trouble. Uh, you have to catch it early and get it removed. Uh, once it's identified, before it gets into the deep dermis and subcutaneous tissue, if possible. Um, yeah, because as we said, like for the 10th time, if it gets into the deep dermis or subcutaneous, there's big blood vessels there, and those cells can get loose in the bloodstream and kill you. Look at this one. What do you think this is? I guess it kind of said there. Uh, but it's flat. But look at all the colors. Gray, that means these cells are almost back to normal. Black brown light brown can't fold this is this is melanoma that's superficial that's easy one superficial spreading melanoma uh, what about moles versus melanoma that looks scary doesn't it, it looks like a little brain uh, that brainy look we'll talk about i think in the last lecture that's a dermal nevus but it sure looks like uh, melanoma it looks like a nodular melanoma uh, but melanomas typically have more of the following compared to moles or nevi. Uh, melanomas are typically densely variegated. Uh, they're notched, irregular borders. They're growing in size. Moles can grow, but not super fast. And oftentimes they don't grow at all, uh, and it may be nodular. That said, it's really can be tough to tell apart. Uh, management. Uh, so a biopsy is gonna should be done. Sometimes it's a, you take wide margins if it is like this was cancer, 
melanoma and you have to take very wide margins to make sure you got it all so it's not a uh, and they can sew this. Uh, she probably didn't get a plastic surgeon because they they can do better than this. Her stitches look like they're ripped out and filled with scar tissue. Um, but yeah, you have to call in a plastic surgeon to help repair that because a lot is cut out. Um, you also have to check the sentinel nodes around the the uh, area. So whichever nodes those uh, this region drains into, they need to be biopsied as well uh, to make sure that the cancer isn't in those little nerve, those little lymph nodes. Remember, they're like little oil filters on a car. Uh, and if it gets into the lymph system, it'll get stuck. The cancer cells will get uh, stuck. Hopefully, they'll get stuck in those lymph nodes. They will get stuck in there. And so you can biopsy and see them there. And then surgical excision with wide margins is the, is the rule of this. Take a look at this one. It's a 5 millimeter lesion. It does have a nodule coming out of the plane of the page right there. Well, that breaks the rules. I mean, if it's five millimeters or bigger, you you, know, you apply the other A, B, C, D, E rules. Uh, so it's light brown. It's almost red here. It's black here. It's got, this is out, man. This is out to the dermatologist, especially if the patient says, oh, that's been there. You know, it's been getting bigger. It didn't used to be there. Even if the patient says, oh, that's been there for years, I would still send that out. Protect that expensive license of yours, right? There's no... All you have to do is make a referral, and then you, you can sleep well at night. Um, yep, so it turned out to be melanoma, superficial spreading. You'd think it would be nodular, but this was superficial spreading. How about this one? This was an interesting one. The patient's wife said, oh, it's been on his back for years, but it's going away. Look, see, it's going away. We don't need to see a doctor. Or, uh, that doesn't... It doesn't matter. That's the, the immune system is trying to kick its butt, but it's not. It's almost impossible for the immune system to get rid of this. And it's got a big nodule in there. You can't. That's cancer, right? It turned out to be uh, super, sp uh, superficial spreading melanoma, uh, and it lured these uh, people into a false sense of security by the uh, by the improvement of this thing here. How about this one? What about this lesion? On the forearm for the last three years, it really hasn't been growing. It's well, you still would refer it out, but you this sure looks like it looks like lentigo, doesn't it? I mean, I would say it's lentigo, but it breaks these rules, so you got to refer it out. Uh, it breaks the ABC rules. It's bigger than five millimeters. It's variegated, even though it's not coarsely variegated. I mean, it's not black and gray, and but it's still dark brown, light brown. It's the margins are irregular. You couldn't fold this in half. You got to refer it out. Uh, and under the uh, the high power dermoscopic view, uh, the dermatologist didn't like what she saw. Uh, maybe, but in this case, it did turn out to be seborrheic keratosis. Uh, but you, I mean, you can't you can't tell because I've seen lesions like this, and they they turn out to be cancer. Refer it out. If it breaks the ABCD rules, refer it out. Right? Here's a patient's heel. What do you think of that? Oh, is that some dirt? Is that a bruise? No, that's been there for a long time. That's no good, right? That's that acryl intiginous melanoma. That's melanoma. And acryl intiginous melanoma. No good. Cancer. All right. We'll see you. Let's see. Now, next week we have the test is week seven. So we won't do a lecture for next week, but you do have your tests. Remember, we're doing these in person, so you have to come to school. See you guys later.